Hey everyone, I wanted to do a video on USB booting. I'm going to use the MW800 police mobile computer for the example in this video, but I'm going to cover a bunch of different techniques that normally you would run into when trying to install an operating system on a computer that say has a fresh hard drive and no external drives of any kind, that being a CD-ROM drive or a floppy drive. So let's get into that. So this is our example computer we're using. It is a Motorola MW800 mobile workstation. There are no external or internal drives right now of any kind other than the internal hard drive which has a fresh load of Windows XP and all of its updates. So let's go ahead and look at some of the different devices that we would potentially want to look at booting from. Our first is the most common, that is those USB keychain drives that you probably use now in place of any type of real media such as floppy disk or anything like that. These are very handy and really only over the last couple of years, maybe the last few years, has it became viable to use this as an option. Uh, it's really fidgety, it doesn't always work. The next thing we have, and this is my classic favorite to boot to, is our USB CD-ROM drive. How this works is it's a regular external drive enclosure, and it has the USB port here. This is the USB-B, I believe, the standard one you'd find on a printer or anything like that. Power switch, power cord, and it accepts any standard five and a quarter inch drive. I'm not sure if this is an IDE drive in here. Let me see if I can see that. Yes, I do see a ribbon cable. So this actually has an IDE CD-ROM drive inside it instead of the serial ATA. And this was what I actually used to load these workstations. We'll go ahead and show you how that's done here in just a minute, but I'd like to touch on some other alternative media. Another one that more often than not saves my bacon is a USB floppy drive. This one is actually for a Toshiba laptop. Just a little USB pigtail here on the end. I use this on virtually any machine. It, it's universal. It works really well. If you don't have a USB floppy drive in your arsenal, definitely get one. Even the older BIOSes, when they first started being able to boot from USB, it may not recognize a CD-ROM or something like that, but it seems to recognize these. So if you can find this Toshiba one, I highly recommend it. This particular one is a PA3109U-1FDD. There's the model number. Good stuff. Now this is kind of a strange one. Some of you may recognize these. This is a Backpack CD-ROM drive. This is the Backpack Bantam. This was one of the last models of the Backpack CD-ROM drive made by Micro Solutions. And what this is, is a parallel port CD-ROM drive. That's right, that old printer port before there was USB really. And this particular one comes with a PC card, PCMCIA card. So you can actually plug this into a laptop in DOS and use the driver's disk to load the, the MSCDEX drivers, the standard CD-ROM drivers, after loading the appropriate PC card driver, and it appears as any other CD-ROM drive would. These also work great in Windows 9X, Windows 2000. It just plugs right in and it recognizes it. It works great. I've used this a lot. I used to use this a lot back in the day. Uh, I had a Dell Latitude XPI laptop, like a Pentium 133, no internal CD-ROM drive, and this was what we had. Now that we've reviewed some of the options that we can boot from, let's go ahead and check out what the BIOS itself looks like. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and shut this down. And that flicker you see is the refresh rate between the monitor, the backlight, and the camera. 
I apologize for that. Okay, so I got into our BIOS. It took a second because the keyboard was actually unplugged as it turned out. And you can see our various boot options here in the boot priority order that they're in. With our hard drive detected as that 40 gig Toshiba being the very last in the list. So we have our USB CD-ROM. USB FDC would be floppy disk controller. USB keychain. So those thumb drives that I showed you earlier. The LS120 is actually a super disk drive. If you're not familiar with that, it's a floppy disk that holds 120 megabytes. I actually have one right here. This is what it looks like. Pretty interesting. And then our USB hard drive. Old but favorite. And then we have apparently a secondary IDE channel and then IDE channel 0. Now there's no secondary IDE header in this computer, so I'm not sure why that would be there. And then as you can see down here, we have our network card, so you can do the PXE boot environment if you decided to. Okay, so I've went ahead and hooked up our USB CD-ROM drive. I put a Windows 98 boot CD in the drive, so that way something different, show that it's different. So let's go ahead and power up our computer and take a look in the BIOS. Okay, now going over to the boot options. <coughs> See our USB CD-ROM showed up here first. If for any reason it shows up down here, all you would need to do is hit that X key, depending on your specific BIOS instructions, to bring it from the excluded to included list of boot devices. So since that's there first already, I'm not going to bother saving any changes or anything. Let's just go ahead and try it and see how it goes. Oh, and there's our Windows 98 CD-ROM, so let's go ahead and boot from CD. And we'll start it with CD-ROM support and see if it finds it. And it did bring me to a command prompt. So had this been a Windows XP CD or Linux, it would have just loaded straight away. With Windows 9X and the USB boot support thing, uh, it doesn't work out too well most of the time, so I really wouldn't be able to actually install Windows 98 this way. I have uh, actually a little separate trick for that. So this shows the CD-ROM method. Let's see if we can touch on a couple of other methods. Okay, using a tool called Win2Flash and a factory Windows XP CD, I made up a USB key here that in theory will boot the Windows XP install and then I don't have to fuss with the external CD-ROM drive or anything like that. So let's try this and see if this works. As you can see, we are still at our command prompt from when I booted the Windows 98 CD. So let's go ahead and power that off. And then what I'm going to do is unplug the USB CD-ROM. Might as well turn it off since we're done. And then I will take my flash, plug it into where the CD-ROM drive was. And now let's power back on into the BIOS and see what we got.
Okay, now going to the boot device order, you can see that our USB SanDisk U3 Cruiser Micro shows up ahead of our IDE internal drive. So that's all good there. Let's try it and see what happens. Not too much so far. And this is kind of the issue that I wanted to illustrate, is that more often than not, you end up with these USB keys that don't want to work. For some reason, they have trouble with the boot sector. And I've used these to boot operating systems before, and it just, it's hit or miss. It really depends on the computer. If anyone has any good suggestions for good USB keys to buy, they've had good experience with, please let me know and so we can share that with everyone else. Okay, so despite trying this on my Lenovo, had the same issue where the blinking cursor would just pop up. So it's either something with the boot record or the USB drive itself. These SanDisk Cruiser Micros are known for USB boot issues. So no real surprise there, I'm sure it would have worked just fine on a hard drive, USB hard drive, if I had one. So I hope that covers some of the general things that you would encounter when trying to boot from USB or considering when booting from USB. Just like I said earlier, I'm definitely looking for some input on good USB flash drives that people can pick up. So what if your computer didn't support booting from USB? What if you didn't have any USB ports at all? Well, I have an example of this sitting here in my shop. This is a Dell Latitude C400 late Pentium 3 model ultra portable laptop. And as you can see, there's no external drives. But I do have a USB port hanging out right here, which it does not support booting from. Now this normally has a base or a docking station that has a laptop CD-ROM drive in it and that's actually what's used for loading the operating system. So how did I get my operating system on here? Well, I take the drive, pull it out of here, and then I stuff it in either another laptop or what I usually use as a desktop machine where I have a USB to 2.5 inch IDE adapter or a 2.5 inch to 3.5 inch IDE adapter so I can use the drive as if it were native on that local machine. And then I will format the drive and usually I will format it FAT32 using a bootable Windows 98 CD. And the reason why I do that is because I also copy just the install files from the i386 folder, I just drag that whole folder into the root folder of that hard drive. So after it's bootable and those files are copied, I put that drive back in this computer and then it boots to a Windows 98 DOS prompt. And then I do CD space I386, hit enter, and then I believe it's WinNT for the actual to run the setup. It's not set up like it was on the Windows 9X series. So this particular machine, I did have that issue. and. I decided not to use Windows XP. Once in a while I run into a situation where I need Windows 9X, old application. Uh, one example would be I have some Motorola radios here that the programming software was released in 1992 I think and didn't even like the protected mode environment of Windows 9X. It had to run in DOS so dealt with that. Uh, so here it is booting Windows 98. That's what I installed to it. So the same method is actually what I used. Uh, made a Windows 98 boot disk, put my drive in another machine, booted to it, formatted it, 
excuse me, and then I just make a install directory, win98.ins, and then I copy all the Windows files off of the CD into that install directory, put the drive back in here, boot on this machine, and then start the installer. Now the reason why in Windows XP you'll want to start the installer is because you can't really install XP and then stick the drive into the machine. There are ways to do it, but it's not something that the home user average person would really be able to do easily. Well, I hope that about wraps it up. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or suggestions, just hit me up, doogielabs.com. Leave a comment. Leave a comment on the YouTube video. Shoot me an email. Either way, until next time, take it easy.